Chapter 18 The great sage removes a monster from Gale village, taking his leave of the Bodhisattva. Monkey brought his cloud in to land, hung the cassock on a Nanmu tree, pulled out his cudgel, charged into the Black Wind cave, and found not a single goblin inside. This was because the appearance of the Bodhisattva in her true form had so terrified them that they had fled in all directions. Evil thoughts welled up in Brother Monkey, and after piling dry firewood all around the multi-story gate, he set it alight, turning the Black Wind Cave into a Red Wind Cave into a Red Wind Cave. Then he went back to the north on a beam of magic light. Sanzang, who had been anxiously waiting for him, was beginning to wonder why he had not come back. Had the Bodhisattva not come when asked to, or had Monkey just made up a story to escape? As he was being racked by these desperate thoughts, a shimmering cloud appeared in midair and Monkey came down and knelt before him. Master, here's the cassock, he announced, to San Zhang's great joy. All the monks of the temple were delighted too, and they exclaimed, Wonderful, wonderful, our lives are safe at last, Monkey, said San Zhang as he took the cassock from him. When you set out this morning, you reckoned that it would only take the length of a meal or until midday at longest. Why? Have you only come back now, at sunset? When Monkey gave him a full account of how he had asked the Bodhisattva to transform herself, to subdue the monster, San Zhang set up an incense table and bowed low to the south. That done, he said, disciple. Now that we have the Buddha's robe, pack our luggage as quickly as you can. Not so fast, not so fast, Monkey replied. It's already evening. Too late to hit the road. Let's set out tomorrow morning. The monks all knelt and said, Lord Monkey is right. For one thing it's too late, and for another we made a vow. Now that all is well and the treasure has been recovered, we would like to carry out that vow and the treasure has been recovered. We would like to carry out that vow and invite your lordships to share in the Thanksgiving meal. Tomorrow morning we'll see you off on your way west. Yes, yes, urged Monkey. The monks then emptied their bags and produced everything that was left of what they had saved from the fire to make an offering of food. Then they burnt some paper to bring blessings and recited some sutras to ward off disaster. The ceremonies were finished that evening. The next morning the horse was curried and the luggage packed and then they set out. The monks escorted them a long distance before turning back, after which Monkey led the way. It was now early spring. The grass cushions, the horse's hooves, new leaves emerged from the willow's golden threads. Apricot vies for beauty with peach. The wild fig around the path is full of life. On sun-warmed sandbanks sleep mandarin ducks. In the flower-scented gully, the butterflies are quiet. After autumn, winter, and half of spring, who knows when the journey will end as they find the true word. One evening, after they had been traveling along a desolate path for six or seven days, master and disciple saw a distant village. Monkey, said San Zhang, do you see the village not far over there? Let's go and ask them to put us up for the night. We can set off again tomorrow morning. Wait till I've made sure it's all right before deciding, Monkey replied, gazing at the village as his master pulled on the silken ring. He saw close planted bamboo fences, many a thatched roof. Outside the gates soar lofty trees. Houses are mirrored and the water is under a bridge. Green grow the willows beside the road. Fragrant bloom the flowers in the gardens. As sun sets in the west birds sing in the wooded hills, the smoke of evening rises from the stoves along the paths roam sheep and cattle. Well-fed chickens and pigs sleep under the eaves while the drunk old man sings his song next door. When he had surveyed the scene, Brother Monkey said, Go ahead, Master. It's definitely a good village. We can spend the night there, San Zhang urged his horse forward, and in a few moments they were at the beginning of the main street. A young man appeared wearing a silken turban, a blue jacket, a pair of trousers tied at the ankles, and a pair of straw sandals. He was carrying an umbrella in his hand and a pack on his back. He was a fine sight as he walked briskly down the street. Monkey grabbed him and asked, Where are you going? I want to ask you something, where is this? The fellow, who was trying to break loose, shouted, Why ask me? I'm not the only person in the village. Don't be angry, kind sir, replied Monkey, all smiles. To help others is to help yourself. What harm can it do to tell me what the place is called? We might be able to bring your troubles to an end, you know. Struggle as he might, the fellow could not break loose, which made him leap around with fury. Damn it, damn it! He shouted. I get more bullying from the old man than I can stand, and now I've got to run into you, Baldy.
You've got it in for me too. If you're good at in for me too, if you're good for anything, get out of my grip, monkey said. Do that and I'll let you go. The young man twisted and turned, but he could not break free. It was as if he were held in a pair of pliers. In his temper, he threw down his umbrella and his bundle and tore at Monkey with both hands, trying to get hold of him, trying to get hold of him. Monkey was holding the luggage in one hand, and with the other he was keeping the young man under control, and no matter how hard the fellow tried, he could not get a grip on him. Monkey, however, was now holding him more firmly than ever, and was bursting with fury. Monkey, San Zhang said, here comes someone else you can ask. Why keep such a tight grip on him? Let him go. You'd understand, Master, replied Monkey with a smile. It would be no fun to ask anyone else. I have to ask him if there's to be anything to be got out of this. Seeing that Monkey would not let him go, the fellow started to talk. This is old Gao village in the country of Stubet, and it's called that because practically everyone here has the surname Gao. Now let me go. From your get up, you're going on a long journey, Monkey went on. Tell me where you're going and what you're up to, then I'll let you go. The poor fellow had no option but to tell Monkey the truth. I'm Gao Kai from the family of Squire Gao. His youngest daughter is twenty and not yet married. But three years ago, an evil spirit came and took her. He's been staying with us for three years, and the old man isn't at all pleased. There's no future in having a girl marry an evil spirit, he says. It's ruining our family, and we don't get a family of in-laws to visit. He's always wanted to get rid of the evil spirit, but he refuses to go. Now he shut the girl up in the back building for the best part of a year, and he won't let any of the family see her. My old man gave me two ounces of silver and sent me to find a priest to capture the monster. I've been on the go for ages now and asked three or four of them, but they were all hopeless monks or pimples of Taoists. None of them could control him. The old man's just been swearing at me as an utter idiot, giving me five more ounces of silver as traveling expenses and told me to find a good priest who'll deal with the monster. Then I was grabbed by you, you evil star, and that's made me later than ever. No wonder I shouted at you. I'm pushed around at home and pushed around when I go out. I never thought you'd be such a good wrestler that I wouldn't be able to break out of your clinch. Let me go. Now I've told you everything. You're in luck we're in the business, Monkey replied. This is quite convenient. You needn't go any further or spend any of your money. We're not hopeless monks or pimples of Taoists. We've got some real magic powers and we know how to deal with evil spirits. This will do both of us a bit of good. Go back and tell the head of your household that Ming. Master is a saintly monk and the younger brother of the Emperor of the East, who has sent him to visit the Buddha in the Western Heaven and seek the scriptures. We are very good at controlling devils and capturing monsters. Don't lie to me, the young man replied. I've had enough of being pushed around. If you're tricking me, you haven't really got any special powers, and you can't capture that fiend. You'll only be getting me into more trouble than ever. I swear I'm not fooling you, answered Monkey. Show us the way to your front door. The young man saw that there was nothing for it but to pick up his bundle and umbrella, turn around, and take the two of them to his gate, where he said to them, Reverend Gentlemen, would you mind sitting here on the veranda for a moment while I go in and tell the master? Only then did Monkey let go of him, put down the carrying pole, take the horse's reins, and stand beside his master, who sat down by the gate. The young man went in through the gate and straight to the main hall, where he happened to meet Squire Gale. Well, you savage, who have you come back, instead of going to find someone? Squire Gale demanded. Putting down his bundle and umbrella, the young man replied, I must report to you, sir, that I had just got to the end of the street when I met a couple of monks. One was on horseback, and the other had a carrying pole on his shoulder. He grabbed me and wouldn't let me go, and asked me where I carrying pole on his shoulder. He grabbed me and wouldn't let me go, and asked me where I was going. I refused to tell him several times, but he had me locked in a grip I couldn't get out of, so I had to tell him all about the mission you gave me, sir. He was absolutely delighted when he heard about it, and wanted to catch that monster for us. Where are they from? Squire Gale asked. He says that his master is a saintly monk, the younger brother of the Emperor of the East who has sent him to visit the Buddha in the Western Heaven and seek the scriptures, the young man replied. But even if they're monks from far away, they may not really be capable of anything. Where are they now? Waiting outside the gate. 
The old man quickly put on his best clothes and went out with the youngster to greet them, addressing them as venerable elders. Sanzang turned hurriedly round. When he heard this and found them standing before him, the older man was wearing a black silk turban, an onion white robe and Sichuan brocade, a pair of calfskin boots the color of unpolished rice, and a belt of black silk. He came forward and said with a smile, Greetings, venerable elders, as he bowed, holding his hands together. San Zhang returned his bow, but Monkey stood there immobile. At the sight of Brother Monkey's ugly face, the old man decided not to bow to him. Why won't you pay your respects to me? Monkey asked, at which the old man, somewhat frightened, said to the young man, You'll be the death of me, you little wretch. We've already got one hideous monster at home as a son-in-law we can't get rid of, so why ever did you have to bring this thunder? God here to ruin us. Hey, old chap, you've been living all these years for nothing, you've still got no sense. It's completely wrong to judge people by their faces. I may be no beauty, but I'm quite clever. I'll grab that evil spirit for you, catch that demon, seize your son-in-law, and give you back your daughter. I'll be doing you a good turn, so there's no need to fuss about my looks. The old man, now shaking with fear, pulled himself together and asked the men. Monkey took the horse's bridle, told the young man to carry the luggage, and went in with Sanzang. In his usual devil-may-care way, he tethered the horse to one of the pillars of an open-air pavilion, pulled up a gleaming lacquered armchair, and told his master to sit down. Then he brought over a chair for himself and sat beside him. The younger, venerable elder has already made himself at home, Squire Gale remarked. I'd feel at home here if you entertained us for six months, Brother Monkey replied. When they were all seated, the old man said, The boy told me a moment ago that you were from the east. That's right, Sanzang replied. The court has sent me to worship the Buddha in the western heaven and ask for the scriptures. As we are passing this way on our journey, we would like to spend the night here before continuing on our way tomorrow morning. If you two gentlemen just want to spend the night here, why all the talk? About catching monsters? As we'll be spending the night here? Monkey put in. We thought it would be fun to catch a few monsters while we're about it. May I ask how many there are in your residence? Good heavens, the old man exclaimed. However many do you want? We've only got this monster of a son-in-law, and he's ruined our lives. Tell me all about this monster from the beginning, Monkey said. I must know about his magic powers if I'm to capture him for you. This village has never had any trouble from ghosts, demons, or evil spirits before. It was my misfortune to have no son, and three daughters, of whom the eldest is called Fragrant Orchid, the second Jade Orchid, and the third Blue Orchid. The other two were betrothed to men from the village, when they were children and have been married off. I wanted the third to marry a man who would live here to support me in my old age, look after the household, and do jobs about the place. About three years ago, a good-looking young fellow turned up who said that his name was Zhu, and he came from the Mountain of Blessing. He told me that he had no parents or brothers and wanted to marry and live with his in-laws. As he had no family commitments, I offered him my daughter's hand, old fool that I am, and from the moment he became a member of our family, he worked very hard. He plowed and hoed without using oxen or tools, and he didn't need a scythe or a stick to harvest the crops. As day followed day, there was nothing wrong with him except that he started to look different. How? Monkey asked. At first he was a plump, dark chap, but later on he became a long-nosed, big-eared idiot with thick black hairs running down from the back of his head and a great thick body. His face is just like a pig's. His face is just like a pig's. His appetite is enormous, too. He needs several bushels of grain at every main meal and over a hundred griddle cakes for breakfast. Luckily, he is a vegetarian. If he ate meat and wine, he would have ruined us in six months. He has to eat so much because he works so hard, Sanzang commented. But that's not the main thing, Squire Gale continued. He can also summon up a wind, make clouds and mist come and go, and send pebbles and sand flying. He's terrified our neighbors who don't feel safe living here any longer. He shut my daughter away in the building at the back, and nobody's seen her for six months. We don't even know if she's still alive. That is how we know he's an evil monster and why we want a priest to come and get rid of him. No difficulty there, Monkey replied. Don't worry, old chap. I guarantee that I'll get him tonight, make him write out a document divorcing your daughter, 
and bring her back to you? What do you say to that? Because I thought there'd be no harm in offering him my daughter. I've ruined my reputation and estranged all my relations. Squire Gale replied, If you can catch him, why bother with a divorce document? Wipe him out for me, if you please. Easy, easy, said Monkey. I'll get him tonight. The old man was delighted. He had a table and chair set out and wiped clean and a vegetarian meal brought in. When the meal was over and he was about to go to bed, the old man asked, What weapons and how many men will you need? I'll get everything ready in good time. I have a weapon, Monkey replied. You two gentlemen only have your monastic staves. How will you be able to kill the fiend with them? The old man asked. Monkey produced the embroidery needle from his ear, held it between his fingers and shook it in the wind. It turned into the gold-banded cudgel as thick as a rice bowl. Monkey turned to Squire Gale and asked, How does this cudgel compare with the weapons you have in here? Will it do to kill the monster? So you have the weapon? The old man went on. But what about the men? I can do it single-handed. Monkey replied, Though I would like a few respectable old gentlemen to come in and keep my master company while I'm away from him. When I've captured the monster, they can witness his confession before I wipe him out for you. The old man thereupon sent his servants to ask a few old friends over, and before long they had all arrived. When the introductions were over, Monkey said, Master, you sit here and don't worry, I'm off. Just watch Monkey as with his cudgel in his hand, he takes hold of the old man and says, Take me to the building at the back. I want to see where this evil spirit lives. Squire Gale led him to the door of the back building, and Monkey told him to bring the key at once. Look here, the old man answered. If a key would have done the trick, I wouldn't have had to ask for your services. Can't you tell at your age when someone's joking? Monkey asked. I was only teasing. You shouldn't have taken me seriously. He felt the lock and found that molten copper had been poured into it, so he struck it a vicious blow with his cudgel and shattered it. Pushing the doors open, he saw that it was pitch black inside. Call your daughter's name, old Gayo. See whether she's in here, he said. The old man summoned up his courage and called her name, and the daughter, recognizing her father's voice, answered feebly. Dad, I'm in here. With a roll of his golden pupils, Monkey peered into the darkness to take a closer look at her. Do you know what she was like? Her cloudy hair was tangled and unkempt. Her face was filthy and unwashed. Her orchid heart was as pure as ever, but her beauty lay in ruins. There was no blood or life in her cherry lips, and her limbs were crooked and bent. A sad frown on her forehead, her eyebrows pale, weak and frightened, only daring to whisper. When she came out and saw her father, she grabbed hold of him, put her hand around his head, and wept. Don't cry, Monkey said. Don't cry. Where has the monster gone? I don't know. These days he's been setting out at dawn and only coming back in the middle of the night. There's always so much cloud and mist that I can't tell where he goes. He knows that my father wants to exercise him, so he's always on the alert. That's why he comes back late and leaves at dawn. Of course he would, Monkey remarked, adding, Old fellow, take the girl to the front building. You two can have a good long talk. I'm going to wait for the monster here. Don't be surprised if he doesn't turn up. But if he does, I'll wipe him out for you. The old man happily took his daughter to the front building. Monkey then used some of his magic powers to turn himself into the likeness of the girl with a shake of his body. Then he sat down in the room to wait for the evil spirit. Before long, there was a marvelous wind that sent stones and dust flying. At first, it was a gentle breeze that gradually became a tremendous gale. When it was a gentle breeze, it filled heaven and earth. When it grew, nothing could withstand it. It stripped off flowers and snapped willows like stalks of hemp, uprooting forests as if it were picking vegetables. It threw rivers and seas into turmoil, to the fury of gods and devils, splitting rocks and mountains as heaven and earth watched in horror. The flower-eating deer lost their way, the fruit-plucking monkeys did not know where they were. Seven-story iron pagodas fell on the Buddha's head, the streamers in the temple fell on the jeweled canopy. Golden beams and pillars of jade were shaken from their roots. Tiles flew from the roots, tiles flew from the roof like swallows. As the boatman raised his oar, he made a vow, 
quickly sacrificing a pig and a goat as he pushed off. The guardian god of the city ward abandoned his shrine. The dragon kings of the four seas bowed to heaven. The Yaksha demon's boats were wrecked on the coast and half the length of the Great Wall was blown down. As this gale wind passed, an evil spirit appeared in midair. He was certainly ugly with his dark face, stubbly hair, long nose, and big ears. He wore a cotton tunic that was somewhere between black and blue and round his waist was a patterned cotton cloth. So that's what he's like, thought Monkey with a secret smile. And without greeting him or asking him anything, he lay down on the bed, breathing heavily and pretending to be ill. Not knowing who this really was, the monster came straight in, put his arms around him and was going to kiss him. Monkey laughed to himself again as he thought, so he really wants to screw me. Then he thrust his hand up under the monster's long nose to throw him off balance. The monster fell off the bed. As the monster pulled himself up, he leaned on the edge of the bed and said, Darling, why are you so angry with me today? Is it because I'm late? I'm not angry, Monkey replied, not angry at all. If you're not angry at all, if you're not angry with me, why did you make me fall over? You should have been more thoughtful and not tried hugging me and kissing me. I'm not feeling very well today. If I'd been my usual self, I'd have been waiting for you at the door. Take your clothes off and come to bed. Not realizing what he was up to, the monster undressed. Monkey jumped out of bed and sat on the pot as the monster went back to bed and groped around without finding the girl. Where have you gone, darling? he asked. Take your clothes off and come to bed. Go to sleep, Monkey replied. I'm taking a shit. The monster did as he was told. Monkey sighed and said, what terrible luck. What are you so fed up about? The monster asked. What do you mean by terrible luck? I may have eaten some food and drunk some tea since marrying you, but I haven't been idle either. I've swept for your family and dug ditches. I've shifted bricks and tiles. I've built walls for you. I've plowed and weeded your fields. I've plowed and weeded your fields. I've sown your wet. And I've transplanted your rice. I've made your family's fortune. These days you dress in brocade and have golden pins in your hair. You have fruit and flowers in all four seasons and vegetables for the pot throughout the year. But despite this, you're still not satisfied groaning and moaning like that and complaining about your terrible luck. I didn't mean that, Monkey replied. Today, I could hear my parents through the wall. They were smashing at bricks and tiles and pretending to curse and beat me. Why should they want to do that? The monster asked. They said that since we married and you became their resident son-in-law, all respectability has gone by the board. They were complaining about having such an ugly fellow as you around, and about never meeting any brother-in-law or other relations of yours. Besides, with all that wind and cloud, whenever you come in or go out, they wonder who on earth you can be and what you are called. You're ruining their reputation and disgracing the family. That's why they were so angry that they went through the motions of beating and cursing me. I may be a bit of an eyesore, the monster said, but if you want me to be a good looker, I can fix that without any difficulty. When I first came, I had a word with your father and he agreed to the marriage of his own free will. Why is he talking like this now? My home is the Cloud Pathway Cave on the Mount of Blessing. My surname, Zhu, is like my face Piggy and my correct name is Zhu Gangly, Iron-Haired Pig. You tell them all that if they ask you again. He's an honest monster, dot monkey with delight. If he came out with all this without being tortured, now I know who he is and where he's from. I'm sure I can catch him. He sent for a priest to come and catch you, Monkey said aloud. Come to bed, come to bed, and forget about him, the monster said with a laugh. I can do as many transformations as the plow, and I have my nine-pronged rake too, so what have I to fear from priests, monks, or Taoists? Even if your old man were holy enough to summon the demon-destroying patriarch down from the ninth heaven, He's an old friend of mine and wouldn't do anything to harm me. My father said that he'd ask that fellow by the name of Sun, the great sage equaling heaven who made such trouble up in the heavenly palace some 500 years ago to come and capture you. The monster was somewhat taken aback on hearing this name and said, in that case I'm off. We're through. You can't just go like that, said Monkey. You wouldn't know, the monster replied, but that protector of the horses who made such trouble in the heavenly palace is quite a fighter. I might not be able to beat him, and that would spoil my good name. With these words, he pulled on his clothes, opened the door, and was just going out when Monkey grabbed him, gave his own face a rub, and changed back into his real form. Where do you think you're going? My fine monster.
he roared, adding, Take a look and see who I am. The monster turned round and saw Monkey's protruding teeth, pinched face, fiery eyes with golden pupil, bald head, and hairy face. At the sight of this thunder god incarnate, his hands were numbed and his legs paralyzed. Then, with a great tearing sound, he broke free, ripping his clothes and escaped in the form of a hurricane. Monkey rushed after him, grabbed his iron cudgel, and took a swipe at the wind. The monster then changed into 10,000 sparks and went straight back to his mountain. Monkey mounted his cloud and went after him, shouting, Where do you think you're going? If you go up to heaven, I'll chase you as far as the Dipper and Bull Palace, and if you go into the earth, I'll pursue you as far as the hell of the unjustly slain. Goodness! If you don't know how far he chased the monster, or who won in the end, listen to the explanation in the next chapter.